Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. Next year in Jerusalem. Over there, over there in the Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. Welcome back. This is Daniel Woodhead, and this is Theology in Perspective. We're blessed that you could join us again as we continue our study in the Revelation, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. We finished the third chapter, and the last portion of the third chapter was a letter to the church at Laodicea, and that church in the historic church history mode represents the church of the apostasy, and that's what we're seeing now, the apostasy of the church, and uh, we've looked at what Bible verses there are, how this is discussed, and I'd like to continue that discussion today because in more recent times, the apostasy has entered a whole new phase. The old phase was characterized by destructive denials. Now the new phase claims to affirm the fundamentals of the faith, but they've made a big paradigm shift in, in that the Bible is no longer the final authority in determining divine truth. But experience is equally valid. So empiricism or experience or what's happening is how people interpret the Bible or how they say truth is. Now how does this work? Uh, if the Bible contradicts the practice, then the practice is justified as a new move of the Spirit. And therefore, what the text of the scripture actually says is contradicted by this new experience. Now this is a far more spiritual way, if you will, of denying the truth of the word of God, so it's more deceptive. I have to say that God's Holy Spirit will never, never move contrary to scripture. So these, quote, experiences, unquote, are false. It's just that simple. So, the old apostasy, destructive denials, the new apostasy is marked by these practical destructive denials. Now, this in turn has led to a whole lot of strange and diverse doctrines. And it caused many to get tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And it causes many here to have spiritual instability. Now Paul warned that this was going to happen in Ephesians 4 verses 8 to 16. You know, these people may affirm the authority and the inspiration of a scripture, but it's only their experience that determines the meaning of the text, in particular in truth in general. The same thing can be said for even fundamental, maybe dispensational even, Bible teachers that use experience to interpret the scripture. Some, sometimes we call this newspaper exegesis. Some people, not knowing the whole counsel of God well, rely on personal experience to teach them what they don't know in the Bible. Now this new apostasy has produced the same fruit as the old one. They mock those who will not join the new wave. <laughs> Somebody called it being caught in the undertow. <laughs> now, I live next to a very, very large lake in the Midwest. And uh, you can get caught in the undertow at times and get dragged out into the middle of the lake. That's what's going on here. They have caused schisms and it divides both churches and families. So the proper way of determining truth is to go to the Word of God first and not rely on the experiences of an individual, including your friends and your family. Furthermore, the Bible must be the final and only authority on all matters of both faith, what we believe, and practice, actions and experiences. Unfortunately, what's happened in recent years is that this new experience or this 
phenomena breaks out in some part of the church and and people are simply trying to find verses to justify it rather than be willing to admit that the experience, no matter how wonderful or supernatural it felt, was simply not a God. This goes right back to people wanting what they want as opposed to what the Bible says. I've had plenty of people say things to me, well, I know it's in the Bible, but, but I'll have to find it. And I say, well, how do you know it's there if you don't know where it is? Well, I just, I just know. It's not there. It's not there. People rely on experience, empiricism, and replace the text of the Bible with that. Now, most of the proponents that defend this practice uh, don't do this on the basis of Scripture, but on the basis of their own experience. And the most common evidence is the thing that makes them happy. And they say, well, I must. it must be from God. It's making me happy. Satan would not be a very good deceiver if he made one feel badly, would he? He doesn't run around with red pajamas and a pitchfork and a pointed tail with an arrow on the end of it. No, he is an angel of light. He comes as an angel of light. He's the master deceiver. If he came bringing bad things to people, at least that's what he brings, but that's not what it appears, well, he wouldn't be followed at all. Now, some examples of what I'm talking about are the Toronto Blessing, Slaying in the Spirit, the Health and Wealth Gospel, Psychologizing the Faith, the Unity of the Faith, and Predicting the Future, and, and Healing. You know, if people could actually heal, like you see on the television, well, the hospitals would be filled with those people, making everyone well. So it's just a sham. They can't do that. And there's nowhere in the Bible that tells them that. I want to read from you from Isaiah, chapter 8, verse 16, and then 19 and 20. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God? For the living, to the dead, to the law, and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Now we need to understand that. And one of the motives of the book of uh, motifs of you, or the book of Isaiah, is this contrast between the remnant, the believing remnant, Jews who believe, and the non remnant, that's Jews who do not believe. And then verse 16 there, the crucial differences between the two groups is the place that the scriptures have in their lives. The law is the law of Moses, and the testimony is the words of the prophets and the writings. What, what distinguishes the remnant is that they believe that which Moses and the prophets declared. That is the foundation of their faith, and this is also their authority. The non-remnant rejects the scriptures as the final authority and seeks to make God more, uh, quote, real in their experience, unquote. By, by going towards idolatry and looking at gods and goddesses that they, they could see, feel, and touch. And they're, therefore, they're creating more visual picture while they worship. In the 19th verse, in that uh, short passage that I read, Isaiah issues a warning that they are not to go after counterfeit spirits and teachers that chirp and that mutter. In other words, Isaiah is warning people not to pursue supernatural things that cause them to make strange sounds like chirping and muttering. This is what the Toronto Blessing is. People are rolling on the floor and they're yelling and shouting and laughter and crying and carrying on all kinds of strange ways. There's nothing in the Bible that says the Holy Spirit will do that. The Holy Spirit is not going to move contrary to what the Holy Spirit does. One of the worst, and I think perhaps the most insidious of all the apostasies, is what I call the New Evangelicalism. It's uh, also called the Emerging Church. 
and it's characterized by catering to the desires of the people instead of being inculcated with God's word and having our personal world view and behavior be patterned after God's word. You know, the new evangelicalism gives people what they want. One New Testament passage clearly predicts this reversal of the worship of God to the worshiping of man. Look at Romans 1, verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. You know, the idea with this relatively new wave of apostasy is just soft sell the Bible and salvation. It's not attempting to save anybody from the fires of hell. They even deny those, but from an aimless and meaningless life here on earth. And they're drawing in thousands after them. Thousands of people are flocking to this because people are getting what they want and they think that's therefore what God wants. Our experiences and quality of life here to this emerging church are more important than the total service to God and the blessed assurance that he will soon come to lift us out of this sinful, decaying world. Salvation is given lip service and evangelicalism with, with, or evangelism with real confrontation is thought to be too divisive. We don't want to upset anybody. The apostasy here does not want to upset anybody. There's never any mention of hell or the outcome of an unsaved life. They may say that they believe strongly, but their actions differ sharply from what they say. Just like John says, we'll know them by their fruit. Usually their Bible teaching is characterized by an overemphasis on application. Uh, th that is the middle of the road approach. They avoid doctrine as too divisive. Paul warned us that the end times were going to be characterized as a departure from sound doctrine and a departure from the truth. Look what 2 Timothy 4 verses 3 to 4 say. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Now with this divisiveness, they really believe that they're going to lose members of their congregation, and therefore money. But that's what brought them in. The people came in for these things, and maybe they're concerned about it a little, but not enough where they're concerned with money and man-made approaches to self-help. You know, a total dependence on God for their resources is abandoned. And in place of that, they put sound business practices or fundamental marketing techniques. You know, total reliance on God by the elders through prayer and patience is exchanged for parliamentary procedure and schemes for man-made self-advancement and career goals. The pastor is considered as a CEO, not a teacher of God's word. Mission statements and strategic plans are formulated to accommodate personal plans. The Bible is subordinated to man's desires. You know, the thought of prophecy is anathema to the New Evangelical because they, they say it's just too divisive. The division, of course is between those non-literal Bible expositors and the literal Bible expositors. Some have characterized the new evangelical as being seduced by the world spirit of this present age. Satan! You know, you can see it in the leaders that they popularize. Usually, they have a high degree of prominence in the government or sports, and their testimonies are sought after for paid speaking engagements and, and, and book endorsements. You'll never see a Sunday school teacher or a poor inner city pastor held up by them as pillars of the faith. But the Lord Jesus went to them. He went to the lowest members of society to bring the truth to the world. 
He didn't go to the popular and the prominent. You know, this is a spirit of what I call disobedience and a mood of compromise. It's a rejection of many also of the negative aspects of the New Testament Christianity. Hell, for example, sin. They don't want to talk about these things. It's an attitude of positivism. You know, they'd rather be diplomats, not fighters. Positive rather than militant. Infiltrators rather than separatists. They, they just would not be restricted by a separatist mentality. By separating out from those that they should, they're going to lose money. The new evangelical would rather pursue dialogue, intellectualism, and appeasement than have biblical militantism and psychology is quickly becoming their guide if it hasn't already. The use of psychology is rapidly becoming the norm in Christian schools and churches. You know, our culture has become deeply and extensively psychological. The weakness and carnality of the church in recent decades has allowed the psychological mindset of the world to flow into the church. This process has brought about a redefining of many foundational matters of the Christian faith. You know, we used to correctly understand that man's problem was sin. God's remedy was his saving and transforming grace. Romans 5, verses 12 and 17. Now, the trouble is the disorder of codependency. And the solution is group therapy. I know I'm mocking this, but it's not in the scripture, and people are replacing the scripture with this stuff. Formerly, formerly I, we used to understand that man tended to stray from God and follow his own self-willed path. Look at Isaiah 53, 6. And what he needed to deny himself in, take up his cross and follow Christ, now we think that man must esteem himself affirm himself and actualize himself. All this stuff comes from psychological theory, which is primarily a philosophy of life. And we are strongly warned in the Word of God not to be guided by the philosophy of the world. Look at what Colossians 2 verse 8 says. Beware, lest anyone take you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Now, chief among these proponents is uh, James Dobson. Fine man, very wholesome man, good Christian, and he studied psychology, and he, I have heard him readily admit that the men whose writings he studied in graduate school at USC were God-haters and thought self was more important than sin and repentance. Yet he continued for many years to inject this into the Christian church. Beware, beware of the leaven, I would say, of the new evangelicalism. Beware of them. Now there's another concept here that churches espouse, and it's mostly the liberal churches. It's uh, ecumenicism. This is an attempt to further water down the gospel by trying to find some common ground amongst various denominations. And, and even some of these big uh, church councils are trying to plug all religions together. <clears throat> the goal is unity at all costs. Problem is that most of them don't believe the gospel anyway, and the authority of scripture is uh, downplayed. Uh, they just don't see that it's relevant. And they want us to agree with them and fellowship with them. Scripture warns against this strongly. Look what 2 Corinthians six fourteen says. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? 1 Corinthians 15.33 Be ye not deceived, evil companionship corrupts good moral. <clears throat> now, I want to start a section here today, but we'll finish it up uh, in our next two issues. And that is a, a, a discussion of the rapture and the resurrection of the church. 
Now we're just about to enter chapter 4, and this is going to be a digression that uh, is going to talk about the church being raptured. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about some of the different positions of when the rapture happens and exactly what the rapture is and why uh, I believe that it fits between the third and fourth chapter in the book of Revelation. Now, there's some foundational issues that we need to remember. First of all, the more literally we take our Bible, the more fundamental our theology becomes. The less literally we take the Bible, the more liberal our theology becomes. And if we take the liberal route, we lose the message that God has wanted to teach us, and we're lost. We are then lost. We've got to pay attention to the way the Bible was written. We use grammar, good grammar. We use idiomatic phrases, syntax, and all the other components and parts of speech and uh, uh, just the other ways people express themselves. Understanding language is important to get the message through. We don't want the liberal root. We don't want to be lost. And there's an issue that's called the spiritualization of the text. It's uh, sort of like reading between the lines or second guessing. They look at the words and say, well, what does it really mean? I mean, what do you think God's really trying to say here? Look at the words. I like to say that the truth is hiding in the plain text. Don't look for another sense. Look at the plain sense. It's the only one that's going to make any sense. Now, there's three issues that we need to completely understand, and it's important for us to have this foundational information in order to proceed into Revelation chapter 4, because chapters 4 and 5 show us the events in heaven just prior to the initiation of the Great Tribulation. Apostle John is lifted up to heaven into the throne room of God. He sees these pre-tribulational events, and he sees what they are, and he sees how the Great Tribulation is initiated, inaugurated, or, or set in motion. And there, there's some activities that we're going to touch on as to why this happens here. What is that that's going to take place and what the methodologies are? Now, chapters 4 and 5 are like pre-tribulational events. Strategy, planning, throne of God just before the tribulation starts. But before these events, there are some things we need to talk about. And the three concepts that we need to talk about <clears throat> are the church, the resurrection and rapture, and the nation Israel. Who are each one of these and how do we know? And as well, I think we need to talk about the purposes of the tribulation and how do we know. All this is in scripture. I know that you probably have an understanding of these, but we're going to go through this data and see what the verses say and see how these are defined and what their missions are. So we're going to define one of these um, now, and uh, I want you to take a look at some of these things that I'm going to tell you about. I'll just leave with this one today, defining the church. Who or what is the church? The word church is not in the Old Testament. It's ecclesia. Okay, ecclesia. And it means the called out ones. And it's, it's used in different contexts in the New Testament as groups, congregations. There's a visible church, which is represented by the various names on the doors of all the churches throughout the world. People even call the building the church. And we saw in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 that in one level of those verses there's a representing of the church throughout church history. That's the visible church, what you can see, what you can see. That is not the church that the Lord Jesus formed. That is not the church that he founded. The church that we can see has names on the door. And there's different names, Roman Catholics, Baptists, Methodists, Reformed, Lutheran, and so on. It's comprised of both unbelievers and believers. The real church is the invisible church. And that's what Christ talked about when he talked about his church. 
He didn't talk about a group of buildings. He talked about those hearts in the individuals that had been bought by him, given to him, real believers. That's the true church, and it's invisible. He said they're born again. They are born again. So you got the visible church, and you got the invisible church. Okay? Visible and invisible. Now, I'm mostly concerned with the invisible church because that's what is going to be important for us to understand. The individual church is the body of Christ. There is the invisible church, which is the real church, and it's what Christ called His church, His body, the real believers, those that have been born again, those that have been regenerated, and it's invisible because you can't see it. You don't know who's a believer and who's really not a believer. I mean, we can see them by their fruit for the most part, but still we don't know exactly who's in the church. Now, Colossians 1.18 calls the body of Christ the body of Messiah. It's composed of Jews and Gentile believers, and we get into it, we get into it, as 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14 says, it's here that Christ is called the head of the body. Okay, let me say that again. We get into, um, when, when, when we get into 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, I'm going to touch on that a little later, but that's a big discussion of the spiritual gifts of the church. It's a discussion of spiritual gifts and they are, they use the term body, which is analogous to this whole church that we see in Colossians 1.18. And it refers to the body of believers. It's composed of both Jews and Gentiles. So in those 1 Corinthians chapters, there are discussions and references to the church. Again, I'll touch on that a little later. I'm just trying to introduce it now. The Bible does not speak of, for example, missionary activities, foreign and domestic. The Bible only speaks of missionary activity to the Jew first and then the Gentile. It doesn't say that you are to go to foreign missions or domestic missions. That's not how God divides the world up. It's Jews and Gentiles, and that's the mission activity. And you enter the church by spirit baptism. It began... At Pentecost, described in Acts 2, it's composed of all true believers from Acts 2 until the rapture. That's the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. Uh, beloved, I'm going to leave you there for today, and I'm going to pick this up in our next session to talk to you a, a little more about the church. And I want to talk to you about the nation Israel, who they are, how they are defined, I want to talk to you about the reasons for the tribulation. Why is this tribulation coming? And then we'll end this discussion, probably in two more sessions, with the rapture of the church and how we position the rapture of the church. God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you in our next session. We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor an author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the Dean of the Jewish Studies School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a Hebrew College in Massachusetts. Let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast. We look forward to providing you with continuing Bible messages each week on this station. God bless you.